Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of my colleagues here at CloudSmith and ChainGuard, I want to welcome you to our discussion entitled Everything You Wanted to Know About the soft Securing the Software Supply Chain, But We're Afraid to Ask. Uh, so this is going to be an open discussion, a conversation, so feel free to, to hop in you know, with questions if you want to. We do have a Q&A section specifically in Zoom for that, so it helps if you throw your questions in there because it will you know, definitely um, everybody will get the benefit of the answer if we answer it on, on the call. Uh, in addition to that, of course, like, you know, we're all here and uh, I want to welcome you, but I think over the last few years, software supply chain security specifically has become top of mind as one of these concerns for almost every organization, right? That's producing and consuming software. So um, we as a tech community have to try and understand this, but if we're going to wrap our head around it, we really need to have conversations like these, um, um, you know, to improve our collective understanding of where we came from and sort of where we're going. So hopefully by the end of this talk, well, we'll leave with not just a bunch of fear, but hopefully a little hope as well about the future of, of supply chain security and software. So let's go through the agenda real quick here. Um, I will first off just do a quick little speaker introduction for all of us. Um, everybody will do their own introduction and then we'll um, give you a little background on what we do as, uh, as, as our organizations with CloudSmith and ChainGuard as well. Uh, and then we'll get into the sort of the meat, meat of the talk where um, we're talking about, um, you know, some of the things that we want to bring up today as conversations. And again, this will be open sort of like a fireside chat. We're just discussing stuff. Um, and so feel free to ask questions as well. And, and all my fellow speakers, feel free to hop in at any point. We'll be touching on points like what got us here, specifically when we talk about um, previous you know, tipping point events, um, sort of attacks and other things that, that precipitated our, our big concern about the software supply chain. Uh, and then we'll, we'll touch on why this is a, such a hard problem to solve because there are definitely some challenges there. Um, each, each attack and each different compromise or, or issue that comes up really has different origins and different techniques and methods. So, so it can be quite tricky, uh, sort of a moving target. Uh, and then we'll talk about specifically what's being done, where we'll highlight a few open source projects in, in the space, um, specifically around um, efforts that Dan Lawrence has done over at ChainGuard, but also in his time at Google and sort of with open source. So thanks for being here with us, Dan. Uh, and then also we'll specifically talk a little bit about, at the end about what are we doing as organizations like CloudSmith and ChainGuard, uh, and also how you as an organization can help and contribute to the same efforts. Sound good? Okay, well, without further ado, let's introduce ourselves a little bit. So I'm Adil Ligari. I'm a solution architect manager here at CloudSmith. Um, I'm a sysadmin turned solution architect turned manager. I spent the better part of two decades here uh, wrangling uh, Windows boxes and Linux boxes. So uh, over the past five or so years, I've become an active member of the PowerShell and DevOps automation community. Uh, and I'm a speaker and author and super passionate about PowerShell DevOps and automation, yada, yada, yada. Over to you, Patty. Hey everyone, I'm, I'm Patty Carey. I'm an engineer here at uh, CloudSmith. Um, I, I've been an engineer for a, a long time, starting in, in ad tech and moving into e-commerce and, and finance, and I eventually found myself uh, deep in package manager land, which is how I ended up here at, at CloudSmith. Um, and I've worked on at everything here from core package management functionality, securing uh, uh, supply chains, and now I lead our platform team. Uh, part of the responsibility there is securing our own supply chain. So uh, hopefully that's some relevant experience um, for what we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Patty. And Dan? yes, hi, hi everyone. Yes, I, I'm Dan McKinney and I work in developer relations at CloudSmith and I've had a somewhat torturous path through the developer relations. So I, I've worked in um, systems engineering um, and manufacturing actually. So another type of supply chain as well. Um, and yes, uh, it's really my role to sort of engage with the community and educate the community why this is why this is a perfect um, forum to do this today. I'm also um, an absolutely crazy um, retro computing and video game collector. Um, and I, I work as a DJ at the weekends. So that's a, a yeah. Bit of an, an you got a regular side. spot every Friday, Saturday night. Right? Every Friday and Saturday night, which is very different from from supply chains. But yes, it brings a little bit of color to the proceedings. So uh. nice. Thanks, Dan. Dan. <laughs> Second Dan today. Um, mm. My name is. Dan Lawrence, um, and yeah, currently I'm a founder and CEO at a new startup called ChainGuard. But before that, I was at Google for about nine years where I got to spend mm -hmm. the last five or six working 
almost completely in open source and started worrying about open source supply chains. So I've uh, been involved in a bunch of different open source projects there and continue to be in projects like SIGSTORE and the SALSA uh, projects or SLSA. So we have to talk about some of those later today. Absolutely, Dan. Thank you. And thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you for your efforts with open source and, and keeping things open for us. Awesome. Okay. Well, Let's talk a little bit about each other as organizations. Uh, about CloudSmith, I'm going to let Dan McKinney lead this one. Yeah, thanks, Adil. So CloudSmith is, is a, a cloud-native package management solution. So given how essential software artifacts and, and packages in general are to a software supply chain, it's, it's very high on our agenda to secure that, that supply chain. So we have been around um, a lot longer than, than a lot of people think if they're only hearing of CloudSmith. We, we've been around now, this will be our sixth year. So it's a very exciting time for us because as you said earlier, Dil, uh, you know, secure software supply chains are really at the, the forefront of people's mm -hmm. minds at the moment. And it's, it's so close to our hearts as well at CloudSmith. So it's a really exciting time to be part of CloudSmith. So that's who we are. I love this. Second Dan again Thank today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we've not been around for very long. Uh, we've been around for about five months uh, at ChainGuard here. Um, we got started uh, in October of 2021 and we were trying to uh, build a bunch of tooling based in open source to help people make secure, uh, make their software supply chain secure by default. Um, we've seen time and time again that if you make developers do things differently, if you make them change the way they work, um, and then security mm -hmm. is always an afterthought. It's not what you're thinking about when you're in that development loop. Uh, but we believe that if uh, we do this the right way, and if we take a couple steps back and think about the problem a little bit, we can actually make secure software development um, a better and easier way and have it uh, work that way by default. So that's what we're focused on doing. We're still just getting started. So thanks a lot for having us here and giving me some time to talk to everybody. Yeah, for sure, Dan. And I must say, like, you're being very humble. You basically, uh, you guys are slowly picking up the who's who of Kubernetes and, and other salsa and supply chain <laughs> projects. So good for you over there. We, we, we eagerly await your, uh, your, 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 your announcements soon. Uh, all right, so let's hop in a little bit. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the slides off the screen because I think this is a discussion. So let's, let's open it up a little bit and, and talk about what got us here, right? And when we specifically say we, what we've got us here, of course, the scary, elephant in the room is all the attacks and everything that went on, right? But I think there are a couple of events that we'll probably highlight that have helped shape the industry as far as software supply chain so much. Uh, so, and, and I think one of the first ones, of course, is the SolarWinds attack, right? So that was December, 2020. SolarWinds, if you don't know, um, you know, it was a very prominent actor, prominent company. Um, they make software for network and infrastructure management. Uh, and so in December of 2020, they announced that their Orion software had been compromised as a result of a software supply chain attack. And so this is funny because this attack very much was managed to burn the word software supply chain into our collective consciousness, right? <laughs> because everybody now knows that word, uh, that, that phrase specifically. So because that, because this malicious code was inserted into the Orion software early enough in that supply chain, it remained undetected, right? So what happened was got pushed out in, with the other updates to the Orion software and slowly got out to consumers. And uh, you know we're not talking about small consumers here. We're talking about big folks like Microsoft and Intel, et cetera. So, um, little did they know that they were, they were installing those malicious payloads along with the monthly updates. And so that's really serving to highlight part of our problem that these pipelines, we're largely, up until the, this point as developers, we're largely ignoring these parts of the pipeline. And, uh, and this, this is sort of a tipping point event for that, for that um, sort of alertness. Now, now, Dan Lawrence, I know I've heard you talk about this before, but I think you were still at Google working on some open source projects at this point, right? And this is sort of one of those moments, those tipping points. <laughs> Yeah, so this is like kind of right after I'd switched from Google Cloud to Google's kind of core security group. So I'd finally been successful in convincing some people at Google that this was a big enough risk to take seriously as like an existential um, issue for the yeah. internet and, and for yeah. Google. Um, and uh, it was still kind of slow though, um, until you know the kind of news broke about this uh, this attack and the amount of people affected and everything. So almost overnight, we went from uh, why is why <laughs> why is no one listening to us to why haven't we been doing this for years? And I was quickly followed up with some of the stuff I think you're going to chat about. And minute with you know the u.s government looking around too and mm -hmm. executive orders and new regulations and new compliance and everything so um yeah it has become an increasingly hot topic over the last couple of years unfortunately because of attacks and not because uh we were as an industry uh ahead of the game but it tends to work that way unfortunately yeah it's not a problem until it's everybody's problem right 
exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that that yeah no that definitely was one of those moments I think as for everyone in the industry I was working at the time I believe at Chocolate Software and it was uh, you know we kept on getting that question again and again where suddenly folks were like hey you know we need to secure our software supply chains and I'm like okay that's great I mean we kind of been preaching this stuff for a little bit but now suddenly we're getting all of this attention right um, so I think I think a lot of folks perked up their ears here and and sort of. Your, your C-level staff, the higher folks who are normally not as concerned, <laughs> suddenly started tuning in and asking these questions. Yeah, I've seen pictures of board decks now with this on a slide from every CISO out there. So it's uh, something uh -huh. everybody's trying to rapidly come up with an answer to. <laughs> I know, I know. Over the past year, everyone's learned the acronym SBOM, and it's yeah. kind of funny because it's like, really, <laughs> we've been talking about this for a while. But yeah, no, very, very true. So so I think, yeah, leading on to that timeline-wise, right? So in, in February 2020, 21, I think was one of these announcements where like um, where Alex Pearson, who's a security researcher, showed that he was able to compromise supply chains as well. Um, and he was luckily a white hat hacker. So we didn't have the benefit of, of, of stress there or, or, or sorry, the, the, the negative effects of it. But of course, there have been copycat attacks since then. Right. And I want to highlight this one specifically because I think he did this basically by, you know, sort of subverting the logic that's in the actual process of of of. Um, uh, the, uh, of the normal supply chain, right? So, so as developers, a lot of times we want to use dependencies, right? Obviously, we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. And so this is specifically referred to as dependency confusion, right? And uh, it's similar to sort of typo squatting as another type of attack where, you know, essentially what he did was int he introduced public packages into widely used public registries that shared the name of private packages for a lot of big organizations. And we're talking 35 different companies. We're talking names like Microsoft, Apple, PayPal, Tesla, you know, like it wasn't a small, small attack, but basically he was able to very simply um, do that by creating packages on public registries with similar yeah. names. Right? Yeah. So it highlighted another thing where it's the, the functionality of the, the package registries and the, the package management systems by default are to trust the pub public registries and pull those down. But, you know, it's the whole who watches the watchmen, right? At that point, um, we're not sure. Like, I mean, we, everybody had to overnight kind of figure out, wait a minute, we have to actually um, change the logic of how we do this stuff. Right, Dan, I think McKinney, you were mentioning yeah, something. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the real problem, Adil, there was that, I mean, essentially, this was a problem with uh, like configuration, like the way people mm -hmm. had configured their package manager clients to, you know, be able to hit public sources, uh, like in preference to their private internal repositories, but there was no red flags, like not, you know, it, it went ahead. It wasn't that it was, you know, in contrast to SolarWinds, which was a breach of their build system. This was normally running build systems that just were, you know, configured incorrectly, but didn't shout about it when something unexpected happened. So because pipelines are so automated, now mm -hmm. that, that that's mm -hmm. going that, that that's what enabled that you know the automation mm -hmm. kicked in packages get pulled in things mm -hmm. get built mm -hmm. and there was no point where something shouted that to everybody and why is why, why was there why was there no point when that happened well it's, it's kind of like dan said earlier that mm -hmm. it's not the default and it's not easy enough it's not easy enough to have that 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 default stance of of the you know something unexpected or there's a problem or there's something we suspect may be a problem and maybe we should have eyes on this the the heavy automation um sort of drove that and, and look i'm a huge fan of automation i mean obviously automation is what enables you know companies to move with a real you know high velocity and deliver software quickly and and and, and that's fantastic as an industry but it has to come with checks and balances because you know automation run amok will will lead to these kind of problems and that's that's i think a core difference between dependency confusion and the solar winds attack both were supply chain breaches right and both mm -hmm. re resulted in malicious or potentially malicious software getting out into the hands of users and um, but there is a subtle difference there you know so but um yeah the the, the lack of visibility on on that process and, and the lack of alerting and, and automatic red flags there is what really caused the problem mm -hmm. okay so this is great because i'm going to pick on you a little bit and so um Thanks. 
because <laughs> I love to. Um, so we have a Q&A question. So while you're at this talking about these specific software supply chain, I got, uh, Musa asks, um, starting from the basics, can you please define what is meant by software supply chain? So defining our terms, of course, where everybody wants to be on the same table. Okay, um, I'll, I'll have a go at that then. Yes, okay. I'll have, yeah, I'll have sure. a go at that. Um, well, look, I'm a big fan of doing this as well. So apologies to everybody, but I love to draw analogies, right? So, and, and I worked for five years in manufacturing. It was a silicon wafer and um, fab actually. So I was very familiar with the term, a bill of materials, right? And, and what goes into a final built product. That's very easy to see in manufacturing, right? Because you know your suppliers, your raw materials, they come in, they go through a production line process and out the other end comes a finished product. That's the same for software supply chains, right? You have mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, raw materials that you ingest almost, and those are the open source libraries and projects that, that you're building upon and you're using as components in your finished you know, product. Mm -hmm. And un unlike the manufacturing industry, um, the software industry, it sort of hasn't reached that level of maturity yet that manufacturing has. So for manufacturing, for raw materials and for supplies that you bring in, there are certificates of conformance. Everything goes through a quality analysis. You look at a company like Apple, you know, they audit their suppliers heavily right back to the, the, the you know, the mine that the, the rare earth metals were mined out of, you know, and, and they have all of that traceability on the supply chain from raw materials right through to the finished product that, that you hold in your hand. And, and as, a, as, a, as an industry, the software industry kind of needs to get there. Now, a problem with that is that it depends so heavily on open source. Everybody uses open source and open source is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We're a great supporter of open source at CloudSmith. So we don't have those centralized um, industry bodies that do quality control and conformance checks like manufacturing does, which mm -hmm. is exactly why we need what Dan said. For the software industry, we need zero trust because we don't have those centralized um, mm -hmm. authorities and organizations to prove provenance of an open source library or to, or, or to give that traceability all the mm -hmm. way back to the source. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what a software supply chain is. It, it's mm -hmm. everything that goes into making up your, your product. Um, and of course, dependency of dependencies of dependencies. Mm -hmm. It's just like the raw materials in a physical supply chain, you know, where a, a screw mm -hmm. can be traced back all the way through the metal that was used to make it all the way back to the mine that the metal came from. And that's like the chain of dependencies and so mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, we'll save some of the, the problems with it for the later parts of this conversation because there are natural points that yeah. we can discuss that too. So, so, but I mean, like just summarized in uh, a lot of what you're saying, which was awesome is, is, is the idea that, you know, I mean, it's kind of around this bill of materials uh, that people yeah. keep talking about software bill of materials, SBOM stands for software bill of materials. And, and you're not you're not only trying to understand where code comes from, but it's sort of each step in that process, right? It's like, yes. what dependencies did I use? What image was this built on? What, you know, factory, if you want to say that, what repository was yeah. used? What, um, you know, what commit specifically added this code? And all these sorts of details. Um, kind of like, um, I know Adolfo from uh, Jangard says it sometimes, right? It's some sort of that packing slip on the side of a UPS package that details, nice. you know, this was checked by this person at this point, yep. went through these waypoints and came from this factory and all those details. So that's yep. kind of where we're getting at as a software supply chain for. And uh, Adil as well, even the environments, even the tooling that was used to build an artifact, that's part of that as well. You know, it's, it's the complete bill of materials so mm -hmm. not just not just the raw materials themselves but the environment that they went through you know the versions mm -hmm. of the tools even down to you know the build host that was used for a particular pipeline run it's all it's all relevant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely so okay the last date i'm going to highlight real quick is uh, may 12 2021 and um, the office of the president of course on this day issued uh, executive order 14028 there won't be a quiz later, so you don't need to know that. But it was on improving the nation's cybersecurity specifically. And so this really highlighted that this, this was a real issue that the government was willing to throw its, its uh, weight behind, right? Uh, and they really talked about removing barriers to the sharing of threat information and you know modernizing some of these practices um, in cybersecurity that had kind of fallen by the wayside. But not only that, actually establishing government-run 
you know, cyber safety review boards and, and details like that. So, so I think this was a big, this was a big point for the industry for sure, Dan Lawrence. And I think you definitely were involved in some of this or, or your projects were referred to in some of this, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it was a, a kind of fast couple months um, you know, <laughs> from, from the from the attack to kind of the um, analysis mitigations covered from the the breach um, earlier uh, or later the year before um, out to getting this executive order out. Um, the executive order though was kind of just the start of that road too, right? The executive mm-hmm. order is a directive on how to produce software, right? It was a directive to um, a bunch of other agencies within the government to start collecting industry feedback and use that industry feedback to shape some recommendations that then get applied in purchasing decisions and that kind of thing. So uh, we're still seeing kind of that process unfold. And actually two or three weeks ago, um, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and mm-hmm. Technology in the US, uh, finally published uh, the, um, not final version, they're going to keep iterating on it, but the, you know, a final version of the SSDF or the Secure Software Development Framework, which is really a great read um, if you haven't seen it yet. But this was kind of the culmination mm-hmm. of talking to people in industry, people in, um, you know, government, people in public sector and private sector, um, and soliciting what the best practices were today, and then collating all of those into a, you know, checklist that you can run through and, you know, do almost like a self-assessment for your organization. Mm-hmm. I'd highly recommend taking a look through it if you haven't yet. Um, it's a it's broken down into a couple different sections. Um, we've got something on the Chain Guard blog about it too. Uh, but this is basically, you know, the industry best set of best practices here for both consuming secure dependencies and then also operating build systems securely um, in your supply chain. Um, mm-hmm. There's some stuff in there that I think will surprise most people because you know there's a lot of <laughs> stuff which is basics, you know, you know, brush your teeth style hygiene that everybody knows they need to do. And then there's a couple things in there that are kind of pushing the envelope a bit. And I think you're going to catch people by surprise later this year if you don't get a handle on it now. So what um, do you want to mention any of those? Because I'm, I'm Oh, man. Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's one funny one that Put I you on the spot. <laughs> there, there's one funny one that I'm curious to see how it plays out. But uh, it requires, you know, vendors that try to comply with the SSDF to also apply that recursively to their vendors, which makes perfect sense oh, because this wow. is a supply chain. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be very slow until the first person tries to meet this. And then all of a sudden it's going to you know ripple across the industry because yeah. we're all in a supply chain together. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. Right. So uh, uh-huh. it's, it's not going to uh-huh. be long before this starts well, uh, creeping up on t- people. <laughs> That's the tough part, right? Is it's it's provenance all the way down, yeah. right? You really need to get folks to buy into it. So I think if once large organizations start hopping on that bandwagon, I think the industry, um, you know, just by sheer momentum alone, is going to be forced to, to to comply to a lot of this stuff. So as as organizations, what you're going to see is if you're selling products and software, um, you're going to start seeing more and more security assessment. You're going to start seeing more and more um, from your customers and consumers wanting details about where you know the entire chain of trust all the way down to, to your to your dependencies, even if they are open source, right? So I think not necessarily having to reveal the entire sausage and how it's made, but at least all of the different components that went into it. Yeah, that. one of my other and favorite parts though, um, not you know, mm. easy or hard, uh, just I loved seeing it called out and you reminded me just talking about open source. Mm. Um, the guidance kind of doesn't require, but it recommends reusing well-tested, well-developed components, including open source. Exactly. Right. We're talking about open source security. There's a lot of misconceptions that open source is worse than closed source or anything like that. Um, and you know, it's not. Open source software is just software, the same as um, closed source software. All software mm-hmm. has bugs. Um, and I think, by and large, most people agree that um, you know, in general, open source software um, is or can be more secure than proprietary mm-hmm. software. That doesn't mean every single library on GitHub is, but I think on average, the stuff you're using, um, you're, you're in a much better uh, spot if you're using well-tested, well-reviewed, well-maintained open source libraries. And so the, the NIST framework actually calls that out and recommends it as a best practice rather than everybody trying to rip all the open source out of their supply chain, right? That would be a mess and yeah. set things back yeah. even farther. Yeah. So you you bring up a really great point, yeah. Dan, and this is one of my little bugbears too, is, mm-hmm. is I, I, I keep hearing this in the industry, right? A lot of folks, um, and I, I've, mm-hmm. I've heard organizations even, even on sales calls or other places talk about, you know, you can be as secure as you want as an organization, but if you're consuming open source packages, you know, you could be vulnerable. And I just feel like that's a little bit fear mongering, right? At the end of the day, yeah. it's really that the open source open source code is in every supply chain. Let's right. be real, right? There's pieces yeah. of it in everywhere. And that's the tried and tested one, you know? So why aren't we backing that as an industry and supporting those efforts more so? Because that's where we all, you know, collectively as, 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 humans benefit a little bit more um, from from, from um, the improvements in that, right, Dan? Dan and Dan? 
Yeah, oh, no, I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't agree more, really. In fact, I do think that uh, frequently, you know, open source software effectively has more eyes on, you know, in the process of its, its development, you know, by its very nature, it's open mm -hmm. to anyone to, to sort of audit and check. So, um, yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, and I know even, well, Patty probably knows better than me, but, you know, within CloudSmith, we, of course, use open source, open source software to build CloudSmith, and we open source as much of our own stuff as we can, and we contribute where we can. So, um, you know, I think that's that's something that we would definitely agree with. Patty, do you want to say anything better? Yeah, yeah like for you? sure. <laughs> uh, I guess CloudSmith, like a lot of other companies, wouldn't exist were it not for open source. Exactly. And, um, you know, being able to to trust that software, being able to um, trust the, the the things that we're building on top of, um, it, it's crucial. You know, it, it's also crucial for our customers. Our customers need to be able to trust that our supply chain is secure. Um, in the same way, we need to be able to trust that the the supply chains of our providers, whether it's cloud providers and and even their hardware suppliers, you know, it, it has to be secure the whole way down. Um, and, and I guess we'll, we'll get there eventually, right? You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a long, hard road to get there. Um, but, you know, so long as we're moving in the right direction. That's, that, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, it, this is a journey, right? And uh, that we're all sort of on together. Um, you know, come, we're unified by our use of open source. And there is no, there is no like quick fix, you know, one size fits all solution here, but it's about figuring out what the bits of that solution look like, you know, and no, nobody can do it on their own. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that's where, uh, Dan Lawrence, you also mentioned, you know, this is security by default, right? There's no quick wins, but we need to make it easier and simpler mm -hmm. for folks to be able to consume security as a part of the supply chain, right? We, we don't want it to be like this thing, like where it's like an afterthought more so. So for those, speaking of journeys, for those of us following along uh, with the actual agenda, we are now into the why is this a hard problem to solve, yeah. right? So I think a lot of this is, is it comes from the challenge, like Dan McKinney, you mentioned before uh, about software supply chains and, and pipelines, right? We have complex pipelines now. So the more that you, we bring automation into it, which we want, um, we are also, um, you know, introducing probably possibly a little less eyes on some of our code um, with the automations and uh, pipelines that kick off and also some complex dependency chains, right? We depend on exactly. software, which depends on software, which depends on software all the way down. So um, so that's where I think this can be a tricky, tricky problem, right? Yeah, it absolutely can be. Um, you, you know, and we've all seen this. You can pull in one dependency that maybe has a hundred dependencies of its own, maybe more sometimes. It gets mm -hmm. pretty ridiculous at stages. Um, and and that's, that's, only, that's only one part of it, really. It, you know, it, it's a hard problem on many fronts, it really is. Yeah, and I think on top of that, like in addition to that, I mean, of course, every attack that we hear about, right? Solar winds, Castella, Log for Show, all of these ones um, that are out. I mean, so I think it was, was it the DevOps security report that mentioned that I think attacks have been up this past year by 600%. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot of exploitation going out there in the software supply chain. And, you know, historically, uh, Dan Lawrence, a lot of the stuff that's, that's been put out there, I mean, I know I've worked on code before where I've tried to sign things and uh, different packages or even different pieces of code in PowerShell world, land. It's historically very difficult to sign, get a signing key or be able to sign uh, anything, you know, when you either have to pay a lot of money or try and try and jump through a lot of hoops with the note, uh, with servers and, you know, like signing mechanisms. So I think it's, it's safe to say that these mechanisms used to be a little bit clunky, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, not for any real hard reason or anything. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't demand for it, really, I think. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it takes, it's like a signing. It's like this, uh, if you signed a package in the forest and nobody verified it, did you really sign it at all? <laughs> Free falling down thing. So yeah. it's complicated to get started. Like if nobody's asking you for signatures or anything like that, then you're not going to do them. And if nobody is used to asking, then nobody's going to provide them and you kind of get stuck in this cycle. So you have to kind of break out of that somehow. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, the attacks we've seen have kind of proven the need for it. And so we're seeing some pretty rapid adoption in SigStore and a lot of these other projects uh, just because of that. Now everybody, it, it's aware, uh, people are aware of it. 
um, software producers are trying to do the right thing um, and uh, software consumers are trying to do the right thing now too. So it's kind of a, a great time to be in the you know, field trying to build tools to make that easier. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree. It's it's funny because I, I, I liken it to, and this is probably a poor analogy, but it was sort of like a Rube Goldberg game sort of oh, yeah. uh, contraption to try and design things. You had to make sure a server was available, you had to make sure you could sign things. And, and historically with co-signing, I know back when we were at Chocolate, it's sort of, you have to pay for actually some of these yeah. signing certificates, right? So yeah. so I think so I think this is this is good because like this, the conversation is just naturally flowing this way, but like mm -hmm. here, let's talk about what's being done, right? Let's yeah. talk about some of these big open source projects. So mm -hmm. I think a natural uh, starting point to this is six store, right? Sure. Um, do you want to reference that, Dan? Yeah, sure. I can tell a quick story there. Um, we were studying kind of code signing and why it wasn't being adopted in different ecosystems for a while within the open SSF and, and at Google. Um, and we saw kind of a, a similar thing play out across all the ecosystems where, you know, the tooling wasn't great. People proposed adding signatures to Python or NPM or Ruby or something like that. Um, and it's just really complex when you start thinking about key distribution and who's going to verify what and what does the signature even mean? And these conversations just kind of stalled out because there wasn't much, uh, you know, motivation, I think. Um, but then on the flip side, there were all these kind of walled gardens and other commercial ecosystems where signing was happening all the time, right? If you publish an Android mm -hmm. app or uh, you know, uh, yep. Windows drivers or something like that, you need to sign them. Um, mm -hmm. And so in those worlds, 100% of everything you signed just because you had to. Um, and the way those uh, um, kind of uh, tool chains worked and everything was with kind of traditional certificate authority hierarchies, the same way mm -hmm. TLS works in your browser or open source alternatives were most commonly using something like PGP and one of those trust, um, which was kind of finicky and hard to get right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we started looking into the commercial code signing stuff, it, you know, just kind of gave us all these flashbacks to what the internet used to be like, you know, five, yeah. six, eight years ago before Let's Encrypt came along. Oh, yeah. If you remember trying to set up like an Apache server or something and get the, uh, you know, a TLS, so you'd have the green shield next to your... Oh, the green shield, yeah. Yeah, the green shield in your browser rather than the red X, right? You know, you'd have to find a CA, you'd have to pay them, you know, a couple hundred dollars. They'd do some verification. You'd have to send them something on official letterhead for your company, right? Mm. All these kind of meaningless yeah. poops. And do you remember the little something. logo used to be in the corner of web pages, like the GeoTrust or Web of yeah. Trust? And, uh, yeah, like encrypted. And it's, you can't just put that there. That doesn't, that, that's not how that works. But yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you'd pay and they'd email you the certificate and you copied into the right directory and rename it and run these arcane commands and if you got it all right then you get the green shield and then you probably forgot all about it and a year later the certificate expired and you'd have to remember how to do the whole thing again because everybody um, was complaining right and you forgot to show yeah and then let's encrypt came along and kind of changed it completely right they set up a free certificate authority as a public betterment group and um got accepted by the browsers and did all of this by automating everything right so instead of certificates being valid for a year with these kind of uh intrusive checks on your identity they made a whole new standard called acme where you could prove that you had control of a domain and you know the certificates were only good for a couple of weeks so if something bad happened it would automatically expire and um they do these continuous checks so they got this going and then within a couple of years uh, you know, it went from like 50 percent adoption of tls out to like 99 percent of the web now is encrypted um and so they show that yeah people do really want to do the right thing if you put it in their tooling and you don't have to think about it anymore i mean most kubernetes clusters you can just put like you know tls colon true somewhere in yaml and you know you're done you don't have to worry about anything else anymore yeah. so kind of a one-line change versus what people had to do before mm -hmm. um so we kind of try to copy that model with um sigstore so instead of having people buy things manage keys worry about losing them um we set up a free certificate authority um and this is all backed by you know transparency logs and some new technology mm -hmm. we also copied from the web ecosystem and now you don't have to worry about keys and you don't have to worry about, you know, validating each other's stuff in person and you can just kind of get them and sign things on the fly and do it automatically inside of GitHub. And so we're seeing a huge amount of adoption there, which is great because it actually gives us a way to kind of trace packages back to where they came from with cryptographic proofs and let people sign things with email addresses instead of having to, you know, keep things on smart cards and everything like the old days. Yeah, for sure. No, I think six door was a big uh, turning point, right? And that's sort of one of the big projects that are coming out of this. And do you, do you want to highlight Cosign at all? Because I think that's a big one for folks with Docker images and mm -hmm. stuff. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, we, you know, Sig Store supports all sorts of artifact types. You can sign firmware, you can sign, you know, executables, jars, all, all this stuff. But um, one of the first ones we started with was um, uh, containers and the overall OCI uh, ecosystem. Um, because, yeah, there's all these language package managers, but there's also been this movement to start using OCI registries to start storing all of these other things with efforts like, yep. you know, the artifacts project and stuff. So we said, hey, if we start here and more people start moving things into these registries, it's kind of a double win. Um, plus, mm -hmm. uh, containers, um, you know, are kind of uh, critical. Uh, they're, they're critical to most production they're infrastructure, and they're kind of the last mile anyway. So uh, the cosign tool there is focused on container signing, but you could also use it to sign things like WASM and all of these other uh, little ecosystems that have developed around storing other things in uh, container registries. Um, so cosign is uh, it's at github.com slash sigstore slash cosign. Um, you can download it. It's in most package managers and just kind of get started signing right away, whether it's on your laptop or in a GitHub hash and pipeline or in whatever CI CD system uh, you happen to be using. Awesome. I, actually, actually, Adil, ahead, um, I'm sure in the next bit about what, what, what we are individually sort of doing to help this, I'm sure Patty has something to say about cosign because it's on our... Absolutely. On yeah, our agenda. Yeah. So yeah, nice. but but no, so, I I I love the analogy there between um like six store and let's encrypt because I'm old enough as well to remember the <laughs> the, the silly dance that you had to do to get oh. a, a certificate and set it up and and I couldn't believe the first time I used let's encrypt how simple it was. I mean, it, it was awesome. It did the DNS verification and the next thing everything was working, and I remember having a thought at that point that. Yeah, that this is the way it should be. It, it should be this straightforward, and that's where we need to get to with with artifacts and packages. I, I mean, it absolutely is. And look, we, you know, we already support, uh, you know, on CloudSmith uh, for artifacts that are stored in the CloudSmith repository. We already support signing them with with a GPG key and, and things like that. But as Dan said again, that's all well and good. All the artifacts are signed, but it's when people come to consume them. You know, are they bothering to verify? Is anybody even mm. look, looking at it? You know, that's that's the other side of it too. Also, so, is it easy to do that, right? Is it, yeah, that, that's what I mean. It and it, it's all down to ease of use. And and it almost, you make it so easy that it's automatic, that, that, that mm. people, why wouldn't you do it then is, is, is the right. question, you know, because it just, it almost, you, you make it difficult to not do, right? Rather than difficult mm. to do. And then mm. you, people have to go out of their way to not do it. So, but um. And we'll talk more about that in the next bit anyway. The, I mean, uh, there's no there's no official ahead. agenda, by the way. So for the record, we can flow back and forth. So I very much think we're now in what are we doing specifically as organizations to help yep. and you know what every organization to do to support these efforts. So Patty, I'm going to throw to you. Yep. Please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to the, the previous example that, that the thing that always sticks out in my head of how awkward things used to be um, as a teenager or getting into Linux figured out how to build Debian packages, figured out how to sign them with my own GPG key, but, but nobody trusted them. And I remember <laughs> right. I was 17, I had to travel 90 miles to a key signing party, show my government ID to everyone oh, else in the room. And then they had to verify that I looked like my ID and then maybe they would trust me. Maybe enough people would trust me that suddenly my signatures would be signed or verified. And um, it was just this horrible, long-winded process. And I, I remember once someone I knew personally for three or four years at the time um, refused to sign my GPG key because I didn't look like my ID. Um, you know, some, some of these open source <laughs> We're really strict uh, in, in how this stuff works. You were an um, imposter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you were evil, just, Patty. Just uh, yeah. <laughs> it was just a, a difficult process. And by, by the time it was all done, I had no appetite to continue doing it anymore. Just it exactly. So yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's a, a fantastic story, by the way. And, you know, I've, I've worked with Patty for a couple of years. I've never heard that story. That's awesome. That's a really good story. Well, how um, do we know yeah. this is Patty now? Now I'm going to yeah, go. Yeah. Have yeah. you got your ID? Can we see your ID, please? No, uh, that's it. I mean, that, that, that's a great example. That's an awesome example. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is also part of this whole thing about, you know, how how not only us specifically as Klaus Smith and Shingar, but how all organizations can help these efforts, right? And I think I think a big part of this is is, you know, now 
with six store and cosine gaining popularity, Dan, and, and a lot of these uh, languages now, and package registries coming on board as well, right? We, we talk about, you know, Shopify's great open source efforts with, with Ruby Gems, right? And stuff, the work they're doing on there, I'd really wanna give kudos to those folks because they're they're leading the charge and, and you know, PyPy, Py, Python folks, and then Maven Central over there. I mean, there's just a lot of like, I think there's, we've hit that, we've hit that like, sort of, I keep referring to it as a tipping point, but it's sort of like momentum, right? We're mm -hmm. pushing forward. Feels like a ball rolling down a hill, and it's yeah, just yeah. It's going too fast to stop now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's now we've got the momentum. Yeah. And the thing is that 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 is what we need as well. We need it to have that momentum because, of course, the last thing that anybody wants here is for these. And Dan mentioned it earlier with wall gardens and things. The last thing we want is for you know more proprietary stuff to come along. It will never get buy-in and adoption. We need the, the projects to be open, the tooling to be open. And of course, as, as vendors, I mean, CloudSmith is a, is a vendor, a, a software vendor. We, we provide a service, but, but what we need to do is support those projects, integrate them with our offering. It's fine to be a vendor that builds value on top of those things in terms mm -hmm. of anal analytics and reporting and all that's superb. But the, the core, you know, the core of it, Sigstore and Cosign, that needs to be widely adopted. And to be widely adopted, it needs to be open, right? And everybody needs to have buy-in to it because we're, we're very anti-vendor lock-in at CloudSmith <laughs> anyway, you know? I mean, we are. We really are. really are. For something as important as this, it needs to be open so that all the vendors can, can jump on board with it. And, and that's what's going to give it the adoption, right? You know, that's mm -hmm. what's going to make mm -hmm. it that secure by default, really, you know? This is very much my soapbox here at CloudSmith uh, for those who know me. I think a big part of what I see is this sort of shared ecosystem of provenance, right? And and so that folks like, uh, you know, um, our colleagues over at Sonatech with Maven Central or, uh, you know, the folks at Shopify with the Ruby Gem stuff, this is the stuff I love to highlight because it's vendors, you know, that are proprietary and they're doing their own stuff, but they're working in the open source spaces, right? And they're developing sort of out loud and in the open and being transparent about, about some of these, um, you know, um, different uh, tooling and different different organizations, different projects that are coming through open source, and and they're putting their weight behind that, right? And I think I think this is a challenge, right? I think a lot of folks, like Dan said, McKinney, you can build value on top of this stuff, and I understand, yeah. you know, as an organization, you're beholden to your stakeholders, you have to make money, absolutely. But I mean, I'll be honest, I'm going to call out our industry a little bit here and say, I, I feel like, you know, the security by default thing isn't always adopted, right? It's often a, an additional feature that you have to buy on top. So I want to say that our commitment here at Cl uh, CloudSmith and something I'm going to continue to push for internally is that the mechanisms for security exist for the free plans, for the open source plans, you know, the communities that we're supporting, that comes in by default. You don't have to pay extra for that. You shouldn't have to. And we should support that ecosystem as vendors, right? And we should support those open source projects to continue doing it. Yeah, I mean- I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> well, yeah, that's quite the soapbox, Adele, I like it. Um, but no, I, I think you're right. And I agree that, you know, as obviously as, as, a, as a vendor, as a software business, um, that is what you should do. You should build value on top. And, and that's fine, um, but you know, and and in fact, that's exactly the, the right way to go about it. Um, but but the the basics really need to be open open source software needs to be available to everyone, auditable by everyone, needs to be out there in the community. It's the only way to get real widespread adoption. You know, and of of course, the attacks that happen shone a light on it, but um, those alone wouldn't really push that forward. You know, so um, it has to be adopted by the community in general. And I know, look, um. Uh, actually, Patty definitely knows more about this than I do, right? Because I don't, I'm not an engineer in CloudSmith and, and Patty is. But so, you know, Patty, what, what do you think sort of coming down the pipeline in, in CloudSmith internally or is worth highlighting here? Um, any I, ideas? I know our, our engineering teams are, are currently working on, I guess, in, in broad terms, to meeting users where they are. So um, it, secure defaults and everything are, are great, but we need to make sure that the packaging ecosystems that our users are working in, whether that's uh, containers or um, enterprises using Maven repositories or uh, Python dependencies, whatever they're doing, whatever open source tooling they're using in the rest of the ecosystem, we need to make sure that all the signatures they generate, the attestations they generate, um, we can work with those. And yeah. we don't want... We don't want to create a wall garden. We, we need to make sure that um, whatever the ecosystem is doing, that we support. So 
and that includes supporting uh, SBOM standards like the, the Cyclone DX standard. Um, you know, supporting and SPDX in future, right? SPDX, um, but it's 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 about supporting all of these open standards, making sure that whatever whatever way our customers or our users are uh, working to secure their supply chains that we're there to meet them when, when yeah. they're ready to do that. Not, not every user is, and that's why the UX of these tools and the UX of these processes is so important. Uh, if we're going to convince these people to make the move and secure their own supply chains, we need to help them to do that. And uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just about uh, working with all those tools. So when, when RubyGems um, implements six door support, we need to be there to meet them with that. When uh, PyPI implements their support for, for signatures, when, uh, when Conda supports the update framework, we need to be there um, yeah. and sort of integrating those things as they happen. Yeah. And I mean, Patty, I know that we have, you know, support for co-sign with our OCI registries coming down the line. And, and I know that kind of stuff, but it's not, it's not just that we're going to provide this kind of stuff for users of CloudSmith, right? We, like I'm sure on the platform team, you guys are eyeing this stuff up keenly internally as well for our own sort of our own build pipelines. Uh, absolutely. Um, it, it's something that came up earlier. If if we want our customers to have secure supply chains, we're part of their supply chain. Absolutely. We need to be secure and our supply chain needs to be secure. So it's turtles all the way down. So yeah. we, we need to be able to trust the software that we're deploying so that when, when we make attestations about the software that our users are shipping via CloudSmith, that we know that those are secure. Um, it, so we need, we need to be able to trust our cloud supplier, our, our cloud provider supply chain, they need to be able to trust their providers. So, you know, we can really only do the work for ourselves um, and push others to do that work. But um, so, yeah, it, it's it's really just about utilizing all of those tools internally as well and exposing the the parts of, of those processes that allow the users to, to verify that we're doing the right thing as well. It's, it's, it's one thing for us to say that we're secure. We need to be able to prove to the, the users and the people building on top of our platform that we are actually secure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I think that that's, that's a great way to sum it up. I think uh, I, I will say, Patty, I think uh, hopefully we're gonna see ourselves uh, on the friends of six store repo soon. So that's the so idea. Yeah, that, that's, that. it. Yep. that's yep. the idea. Absolutely. For sure. And I don't know if Dan Lawrence, you'd like to say anything about what Chain Guard's doing in this space, but I know that there's stuff that you were going to announce very soon, right? Can't wait. Um, oh, no, I don't remember. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so and I'll just say, I, I love the way you talked about all the different ecosystems because you were using the word when, and I think that's awesome. Instead of if, you're saying when Sigstore comes to Ruby and when it goes to PyPy and when the update framework goes to Conda. I just love that, like in the last year, I don't think you could have used that word. I think you would have, yeah. it would have been like a, a maybe if future, you know, maybe someday uh, type of thing. But now it really is kind of like inevitable. So that's awesome. So, so true. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny how that like a year ago, you couldn't even imagine these conversations. Yeah happening yeah. the same way yeah so i i will just add one thing i know we've only got 10 minutes left and there's a few questions in the q a mm -hmm. that we're probably mm -hmm. going to want to address but, yeah absolutely um just, i just wanted to throw this in because this is something again I'm, well no, not again this is only the second time i've made an analogy <laughs> in this discussion right so i will make an analogy again with the manufacturing industry because the entire focus of this talk has been on threats to the supply chain right and when you say that a lot of people think of malicious packages, impersonated packages, you know, a, a bad guy, right? A bad person, you know, you know, corrupting your build process, but also don't lose sight of the fact that availability is a threat to your supply chain, right? Now it's not often that a package becomes unavailable, but it has happened, right? I, I, Everybody remember the chaos when, when left pad was removed from MPM, right? You know, so there's, and, and this is absolutely not the focus of supply chain security, but it's an aspect. And that is that in that analogy that I used in manufacturing, what do manufacturers do? They build up inventory. They have a warehouse, right? So that's something that we do think about in CloudSmith, right? CloudSmith repositories, you can pull in packages from upstreams, you can cache them so that if, if the upstream source disappears, 
you have those local cached copies of packages, your build pipelines won't fail. Now, of An course- important difference though, Dan, I will mention is yeah. private is trusted first, not public. <laughs> yes, of course, of course, mm -hmm. private is trusted first. And again, this does not absolve you from all those packages need to be verified and signed. And all, yeah. all of that good stuff that we've been spending the time talking about, but it's just worth, just, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that um, you know, your availability and, and the reliability um, is, is just, uh, you know, a part of a secure software supply chain as well, just the way it's the part of, of a secure physical supply chain. You know, if, if a supplier disappears and um, you need to have a plan in place for that. Um, and, and that's just, it's just worth thinking about, but I absolutely agree. It's secondary to the threats that are being addressed by Sigstore and Cosign and, and vendors like us adding support for those tools. Definitely secondary to those, but it's not something I hear people talk about much or bring up in these discussions. So I just wanted to put it out there before we we, we lost sight of it, that was all. I think in general terms though, Dan, it, it, it's a good point that there's no silver bullet here. There's no one no. fix. There are a hundred things here. There are a hundred different parts of the supply chain, 100 moving parts that all need uh, care and attention you know, yep. as we, we work to secure our supply chain. So signing alone, great. It's not enough, you know? No. Uh, you know, caching dependencies from upstream so they don't disappear, it's great. It's not enough. Not you know, enough. We need all of these things to work together. We need the, the entire community to come together and, and work to address all of these problems or knocking them down one by one. And we'll get more secure over time but it, it's, it's going to be a journey to get there. Definitely. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. And I think that that's part of the challenge, right? Is I think people look at this problem and often security folks will come up and list all the different things that you need to, to, to have in order in order for something to be trusted, right? As a package or, or any, any sort of artifact that you have up in the registry. And I think the, the challenge there, Patty, specifically is I feel like, yes, absolutely. We, there's a lot of different things and you need to secure it all the way down, but we have to start somewhere. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's the important thing to not lose sight of. We have to do make these micro steps along the yeah. way in order to get the whole thing secure. And I think you can't, a lot of folks get a little bit overwhelmed with all the different things to do and then just throw up their hands up in the air. And I think that that's, you know, hopefully projects like Six for Cosign and other things like that and open source efforts and getting together as a community um, will help us to, you know, make these things not difficult anymore. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, Adil, the, the Salsa framework is a great example of that because, mm -hmm. like, level level one on the Salsa framework is pretty easy to achieve. You know, it's it's a pretty simple step to get to that. Obviously, getting up to level four, yeah, there's a lot more you need to do, but but mm -hmm. it's giving you know accessibility. You know that that you can get something in place and you can feel good about it and you can feel good that you've taken the first steps on that path. You know, so you don't mm -hmm. jump to Salsa level four from nothing. It, that, that would be, you know, that would be a really monumental thing to try and do. And it would, it would put you off if you tried to do that. So you start off, as Patty says, little steps along this journey, but we need to do it together. Nobody can run off on their own on this. We need to do it together as an industry, you know? Yeah. And so I guess this is a good um, like transition naturally into one of the questions that was up, um, um, which I think Dan, you were starting to answer, which is, um, you know, uh, Musa heard two terms on here cosine and salsa and he wanted a little bit maybe just a, a little bit more definition and, and discussion around it we can definitely provide links in the chat um, if that's helpful but if you want to spend a little bit of time touching on cosine and salsa specific sure yeah i'm dropping the links yeah. in here right now excellent um, awesome. there you go there you yeah, go boom so the system works cool um yeah, and I'll just stress that Salsa is a security level. I can never remember what it stands for. Oh, man. Security levels for software artifacts, something like that. S like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it is, uh, you know, framework one levels one through four today. Um, it's still kind of under, you know, heavy development as we iterate and people actually try to work up their way through that ladder. Um, like you said, level four is pretty hard. I'm not sure if anybody's really done it yet. So definitely I'm not looking sure for either, feedback yeah. as we get to those higher levels. Um, one was designed purposefully to be easy so people can kind of get on the train and get a badge set up in their repo and show what they're doing. Um, the way I kind of think about it is uh, level one is like, don't do the build on a machine under your desk or your laptop or something like yes. that. That's basically all you have to do is like use a build system. <laughs> yep. Um, mm -hmm. Level two is, you know, like prove that somehow. So publish some like provenance or something like that. So people can 
and verify that you're using a build system. Level three is, you know, like use a secure build system. Not, maybe not just everything will qualify today. It'd be great if, you know, all these build system operators do increase that security. Um, but, uh, and then level four is, you know, change your whole build process to make it hermetic and not pull dependencies from the internet and, you know, perfectly reproducible stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, kind of far out there, the, the most secure you can possibly be. So uh, I think there's a pretty big jump from three to four today. That's kind of my take looking at it. Um, so we might end up, you know, adding an intermediate one or something in there, shifting some things around. But um, yeah, it's designed to be pretty easy to understand understand and you get value out of each level as you go. Awesome. Yeah, no, and that's a great, great summary of it, I think. <laughs> and so along those lines, similarly, right, um, it's when we talk about SIGSTOR and Cosign, right, Cosign specifically, yeah. um, I think, so SIGSTOR, you can think of it kind of like your umbrella, right? The way that just <laughs> being able to sign software in different ways and Cosign is specific for sort of OCI container images. Correct. Is that a good way to understand it? Yeah. yeah. And we can drop the, the links in the chat as well. So there's one last thing I'll do is, is this, there's a meaty question here, which we kind of need to get to. And I think it's it's kind of one of those things which is open-ended a little bit because I think I'd like feedback from all of you on it. And, and I think um, it definitely, this is part of the stuff that we need to work together as, a, as, a, as an organization or as a community to do, right? With, as all of these organizations. So um, Varun brought, brings this up and says, many organizations nowadays rely on distributing their software from sandbox containers or images. Um, what could be the best practice as a customer who's consuming these kinds of distributions from the vendor? Um, they need contain those containers and images or, or sandboxes um, are an entry point for supply chain compromise. Any good practices for the customers to conduct a test on these binaries? So please do suggest. So this is talking along the lines of, hey, as consumers of these products, for these container images, what can we do be doing as best practices to, when we're when we're on the consumption step of this to make sure that we're checking the boxes? I'll let Patty and Van take that one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more a best practice sort of yeah. conversation, but yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I can start. I mean, there's probably like 37 different threat models you <laughs> probably be wanting to worry about here, but I break them down into like two categories first. Um, you know, two high level ones. First one is, you know, you're, you're consuming this kind of black box thing from a vendor. Um, you know, it might have some vulnerabilities inside of it. And if you run it, then you become vulnerable. So that's kind of like, you know, if you're consuming bad software, it doesn't matter if, if it's signed and you know exactly where it came from and you have all the metadata, right? It's still bad software. Not bad, bad. Like, you know, it might be vulnerable. It might be old. CVs might have been found, that kind of thing. Um, and so you want to do your scans on it. You want to make sure that the code is running an environment of least privilege, all of that stuff. So if it is compromised, right, it's not running as root with, you know, network access and access to your database and all that stuff that can get exfiltrated. Um, the second one is, yeah, did this actually get to me from the distributor correctly without being tampered with those kind of things? And so that's checking the signatures if they provide them, checking the hashes if they provide them, asking them to if they don't, depending on your relationship with the vendor um, and making sure that, you know, an attacker in the middle can't change it, um, that you're grabbing it from the correct place and that uh, you know, hasn't been tampered with along the way um, or somebody could insert some kind of targeted malware. So at a high level, those are kind of the two big categories I look at and you kind of need to treat them a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Pat, do you want to add to that at all? Or you like oh, what I mean, you I said? Think, I, I think that covers it. Um, yeah. Really, it's, it's about it's about provenance. On the other side, is just old-fashioned traditional ops stuff. It's like mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you're using well. exactly <laughs> yes, if you're using this sort of tooling, right? I think um, as a consumer, even you know, build the expectation with your vendors, ask them to be yeah. able to support that. Like if, if they don't currently have a mechanism for having an SBOM alongside an image, right? Um, then ask them for it, put in the feature request because that's this sort of, um, you know, desire or demand from the industry is gonna what's, what's gonna push a lot of vendors that way. We've heard it a lot on this side and believe me, we hear you and we're, we're working on that and we wanna continue to support those efforts. So so yeah, that's what you can do to do be a part of that, but have that, build that expectation, especially with your cloud vendors that it should be deep by default. You should, you should make this stuff available to us. And it doesn't matter how much I'm paying you for it. Just, you know, like I'm, I'm a consumer of yours, you should, be, uh, you should be giving me this stuff by default and, and available to everyone, right? democratize its sort of security, right? Absolutely. It's, it's the rising tide lift all, lifts all boats things, right? Mm -hmm. like, That's it. Really better for open source, it gets better for everyone. That's right. That's exactly yeah. it. Great phrase. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we are running up against time a little bit. So I want to thank my colleagues here, uh, Patty, Dan, and Dan, for, for all of your wonderful insights. So 
I look forward to some of the stuff we're doing over here at CloudSmith and also eagerly watching uh, what's going on at Vanguard to see what's, oh, yeah. what's happening there in this space. So folks, again, thank you so much for all your time um, and, and joining us on this talk here today. Uh, and this doesn't happen without all of you and all of our efforts together. So remember that and, and thanks for sharing it. Hopefully you've left with a little bit more information around um, you know, making this um, big issue and sort of tough issue a little bit more accessible for everyone. Yeah. Um, Thank you so, for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Excellent thanks, time, yeah. thanks, thanks, all of you. So, uh, with that, I'm going to throw back over to Marisa at Linux Foundation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adele and Patty and Dan and Dan for your time today. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So, we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful day. <laughs>